Hi everyone, this is Professor Emda Science, and today I want to discuss the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. Harmonic oscillations permeate science, as the low energy behavior of many systems is harmonic. For example, the quantum harmonic oscillator allows us to study the properties of systems ranging from the motion of atoms in solids to the behavior of light. We have a whole series of videos on the one-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator, where we learn how to calculate its eigenvalues and eigenstates. And we also have a whole series on coherent states, which provide a quasi-classical view of the quantum harmonic oscillator. Today, we want to discuss the quantum harmonic oscillator from yet another point of view, which is what happens when we go from one to three dimensions. To do so, we're going to exploit the properties of tensor products. This means that this video is also a great resource for you to practice tensor products, which is really useful because they feature in many, many different quantum systems. So let's go. Let's consider a particle moving in a three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. We call the state space of a particle moving in three spatial dimensions V, and it's given by the tensor product of the state spaces Vx, Vy, and Vz, where Vx is the state space of a particle moving in the x spatial dimension, and similarly for Vy and Vz. So, as you can see, to understand the motion of particles in three spatial dimensions, we need to use the properties of tensor product state spaces, and if you haven't seen the corresponding videos yet, I recommend that you check them out first, and continue with this one afterwards. The Hamiltonian H includes the kinetic energy, which is given by a term proportional to the momentum squared along the x-direction, a term proportional to the momentum squared along the y-direction, and a term proportional to the momentum squared along the z-direction. And then we also have the potential energy, which depends on a quadratic term in x, a quadratic term in y, and a quadratic term in z. The Hamiltonian H acts on the full state space V, and each of the terms in which we write the Hamiltonian also act on the full state space V. However, we see that the form that the various terms take is rather simple. For example, let's consider the first term here. It is the kinetic energy of the particle associated with the momentum in the x direction. This kinetic energy operator acts on the full state space V, but its action can be separated into this part, which acts on Vx only, this part, which acts trivially on Vy, as it is simply the corresponding identity operator, and this part, which again acts trivially as the identity operator, but now on Vz. The only non-trivial part in this term is the one acting on Vx, so we typically simplify our notation to rewrite it like this, omitting the identity operators and tensor product symbols. All other kinetic and potential energy terms have a similar form with multiple trivial parts, so using the same simplified notation, we can write the full Hamiltonian as equal to the kinetic energy along x, the kinetic energy along y, and the kinetic energy along z, and then the potential energy along x, the potential energy along y, and the potential energy along z. When we work with tensor product state spaces, we use this simpler notation whenever possible, and if you've worked with particles moving in three spatial dimensions before, it's very likely that you'll have directly worked with this latter simpler expression without reference to the full original expression up here. While this works fine for many types of calculation, it is important to keep in mind that we're really working in a tensor product state space, as this can become important to avoid potential ambiguities. Now, to make sure that we become comfortable with tensor product state spaces, we will combine the use of both notations throughout the video. We can actually rewrite this Hamiltonian in another form that will prove really convenient. Let's consider H. We can next group all the terms that act non-trivially along the x-direction, which are this kinetic energy term and this potential energy term, to end up with this combined x-dependent term, and then the identity operators for the y and z directions. We can do the same for the terms acting non-trivially along y to end up with this identity, this y-dependent term, 
and this other identity. And we can of course do the same for the terms acting non-trivially along Z to end up with this identity, this identity, and this Z-dependent term. We now recognize this here as the quantum harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian of a particle moving in the X spatial dimension. This here as a corresponding Hamiltonian of a particle moving in the Y spatial dimension. And this here as a corresponding Hamiltonian of a particle moving in the Z spatial dimension. With this, we can rewrite the Hamiltonian of a particle moving in a three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator as the sum of a term that only involves the Hamiltonian of the particle moving in the x direction, plus the Hamiltonian of the particle moving along y, plus the Hamiltonian of the particle moving along z. Using the simplified notation we discussed in the previous slide, we can rewrite this as the sum of hx plus hy plus hz. So what have we accomplished? This last expression shows that the Hamiltonian h of a particle moving in a three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator is simply given by the sum of the Hamiltonians corresponding to the particle moving in each of the three dimensions separately. And this suggests that we will be able to construct the full solution of the three-dimensional problem simply by combining the solutions of the individual one-dimensional problems. And this is indeed what we're going to do in the rest of this video. As always, the solution of the quantum harmonic oscillator involves the solution of the eigenvalue equation. Remember that for the three-dimensional harmonic oscillator, we work in the state space V, and we write the eigenvalue equation as h acting on psi equal to e psi, where as usual these are the eigenvalues and these are the eigenstates. Given the form of the Hamiltonian, it will be useful to consider the eigenvalue equations of the motion of the particle along the individual spatial directions. If we start with the state space Vx of a particle moving in the one-dimensional x spatial direction, then we have this eigenvalue equation for the quantum harmonic oscillator eigenvalue. We've already solved this problem of a one-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator, and from the corresponding videos we know that the eigenvalues are quantized and given by this expression, where nx is a non-negative integer. We can similarly work in state space Vy of a particle moving in the one-dimensional y spatial direction with this eigenvalue equation, these quantized eigenvalues, and again the ny are non-negative integers. And for Vz we have the corresponding eigenvalue equation with the corresponding quantized eigenvalues and the nz are still non-negative integers. From the video on eigenvalues and eigenstates of tensor product state spaces linked in the description, we know that given the form of the Hamiltonian up here, we can build the eigenvalues and eigenstates of H from those of Hx, Hy, and Hz. In particular, the eigenstate psi is given by the tensor product of the eigenstates Nx, Ny, and Nz. And the eigenvalue E is given by the sum of the eigenvalues ex, ey, and ez. And this is it! We've solved the eigenvalue equation of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator by simply using our knowledge of the solution of the one-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. In the rest of the video we will explore some interesting features of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. Let's first consider the eigenvalues. Remember that we've just figured out that the eigenvalues E of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator are given by the sum of ENX, ENY, and ENZ. Given the expressions up here, we can rewrite the eigenvalue E as equal to the sum of this term proportional to omega x, this term proportional to omega y, and this term proportional to omega z. The eigenvalues of the three-dimensional harmonic oscillator are labelled by a collection of three numbers, nx, ny, and nz. And this means that we can label the distinct eigenvalues of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator with these three numbers, where nx, ny, and nz can each take any non-negative integer value. To study the eigenstates, 
it will first prove convenient to consider the ladder operators. Let's start with Vx. From our videos on the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, we know that the lowering operator Ax is defined as this prefactor times the position operator plus this other prefactor times the momentum operator. The raising operator is the adjoint A dagger of the lowering operator and is given by the corresponding term proportional to position and the negative of the corresponding term proportional to momentum. These ladder operators are used thoroughly in the study of the quantum harmonic oscillator. For example, we use them to figure out the allowed eigenvalues. But now we are interested in their action on the eigenstates. The lowering operator acting on an energy eigenstate gives another energy eigenstate where we've removed one quantum of energy. Conversely, the racing operator acting on the same energy eigenstate gives another energy eigenstate where we've added one quantum of energy. This is a quick refresher on ladder operators and for a full description of these ideas, you should check out the videos in the description. For our purposes today, the important thing is that when we work in Vy, we can define an analogous lowering operator and analogous raising operator and when we work in Vz, we can define an analogous lowering operator and an analogous racing operator as well. From the video on tensor product state spaces, we know how to extend the action of these ladder operators to the full state space. As an example, consider the operator Ax, identity Y, identity Z, acting on an energy eigenstate Nx, Ny, and Z. From the video on tensor products, we know that each operator acts only on the state from its original space, so Ax acts on Nx to get this. Then the identity acts on Ny to trivially get Ny back, and finally this identity acts on Nz to trivially get Nz back. In the simplified notation for operators, we would simply write this as Ax acting on the tensor product state giving this new tensor product state. Although we only write Ax, we implicitly understand that we also have the identities in Vy and Vz. So again, the simplified notation is more convenient, but we need to be sure that we know what we're doing. The ladder operators are important because we can use them to build the eigenstates. In Vx, we have that the eigenstate Nx is equal to this prefactor times the application of the raising operator Nx times on the ground state. Now remember that the ground state is the state associated with the lowest energy eigenvalue and is such that the action of Ax on it kills the state. In Vy, the energy eigenstate Ny is given by the corresponding action of the raising operator on the ground state and in Vz, the energy eigenstate Nz is also obtained by the application of the corresponding raising operator on the ground state. If we now move to the tensor product state space V of the three-dimensional harmonic oscillator, we've determined earlier that the eigenstates are given by the tensor product of the eigenstates in Vx, Vy, and Vz. Now, the expression for this eigenstate is rather long, so bear with me. Using these expressions up here, we first get this combined prefactor, then the application of Ax a total of Nx times, the application of Ay a total of Ny times, and the application of Az uh, for a total of Nz times. All of this acting on the ground state of the three-dimensional oscillator. And these are the eigenstates of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator as built from the raising operators. Just like we do for operators, we can use simpler notation to describe tensor product states such as these. Let's take the eigenstate Nx, Ny, Nz. A common simplification is the omission of the tensor product symbol. Another simplification typically used is the omission of the subindices indicating the original state space to which the states belong to. In this case, the order of the terms indicates the state space of origin. In other words, we understand that the first ket comes from Vx, 
the second from Vy, and the third from Vz. Yet another simplification is to group these together into a single kit, where the various labels are separated by commas. You'll encounter all of these conventions, and again it is essential that you always remember what you are really dealing with, tensor product states. Using this simpler notation, together with the simpler notation for operators, we can rewrite the eigenstates of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator as equal to this prefactor times the action of Ax, that of Ay, and that of Az on the ground state. Sticking with eigenstates, we're now going to look at the position representation, or to put it another way, at the wave functions of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. If we start in the Vx state space, remember that for a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, the wave function associated with energy eigenstate nx is labelled as psi nx of x, and is given by the usual bracket between the position eigenstates and the energy eigenstate we are interested in. In the video on the quantum harmonic oscillator eigenstates, we show that this wave function can be written as this prefactor multiplied by a polynomial of order nx called a Hermit polynomial multiplied by a Gaussian. As you can imagine, if we look at Vy, we have an analogous expression for the wave function in terms of the corresponding prefactor, the Hermit polynomial, and the Gaussian. And if we look at Vz, we also get the wave function again as equal to this prefactor, the Hermit polynomial, and the Gaussian. We can now look at the state space V of the three dimensional oscillator. We're going to call the wave function psi nx ny nz, and it is a function of the three variables x, y, z. It is given by the bracket between the position basis states and the energy eigenstates that we're interested in. From the video on tensor products, we know that we can calculate this bracket by grouping together the objects in the same state spaces making up the tensor product state space. In Vx, we get this bracket. We then need to multiply this by the corresponding bracket in Vy and by the corresponding bracket in Vz. We can now construct the full wave function by using the wave functions along the individual one dimensional spaces above. For the scalar product in Vx, we get the psi nx wave function. For the scalar product in Vy, we get the psi ny wave function. And for the scalar product in Vz, we get the psi nz wave function. And this is it. This is the wave function of the energy eigenstates of the three dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. It is simply the product of the wave function of a one dimensional oscillator along x with a one dimensional oscillator along y with a one dimensional oscillator along z. Now, a word of caution. Notation could be somewhat confusing, so let's make sure that we really do understand it. When we write psi here with three sub indices, we mean the wave function of the three dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. When we write psi with a single sub index, for example this one here, we mean the wave function of the one dimensional harmonic oscillator, and in this case, it corresponds to a one dimensional harmonic oscillator along the z axis. Okay, so these are the wave functions. For the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, we spend some time plotting them. Unfortunately, it isn't possible to fully plot the eigenfunctions of the three-dimensional oscillator as we would need a four-dimensional space to do so. But we could certainly visualize them along the different spatial axes where they essentially look like their one-dimensional counterparts, so I encourage you to check out the video on the eigenfunctions of the one-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator for a reminder of what they look like. Let's finish with a brief summary. This is a Hamiltonian of a three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. In this expression, I spell it out in its full glory in terms of tensor products of operators associated with one-dimensional harmonic oscillators along the x, y, and z directions. For example, this term here is a term that contains a kinetic energy of the particle moving in the x direction and only acts trivially along the y and z directions. When we work with tensor product state spaces, we tend to simplify our notation if we can do so without introducing any ambiguity. In this case, the simpler notation is given by this Hamiltonian down here. 
The Hamiltonians in either notation show that the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator is essentially a simple sum of three Hamiltonians corresponding to the separate one-dimensional motion of the particle in each of the x, y, and z dimensions. We've seen that this simple form for the Hamiltonian means that it is very easy to construct the energy eigenvalues and eigenstates of the three-dimensional harmonic oscillator from those of the one-dimensional oscillator. The energy eigenvalues of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator are simply given by the sum of the energy eigenvalues of a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator along the x-direction, the y-direction, and the z-direction. This longer expression shows the explicit form of these energy eigenvalues. We can also easily build the energy eigenstates. They are simply given by the tensor product of the energy eigenstates of the individual one-dimensional oscillators along x, y, and z. Explicitly, we can write them as proportional to the action of the raising operators on the ground state, and this here again shows the same expression for the eigenstates, but using the simpler notation that we typically encounter when working with tensor product states. Finally, we've also found that the wave function of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator is simply given by the product of the wave functions of three one-dimensional harmonic oscillators, along x, along y, and along z. So overall, the form of the Hamiltonian of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator means that we can find its solutions by simply combining the known solutions of various one-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillators. We've just seen how the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator is a relatively straightforward extension of its one-dimensional counterpart. The energy eigenvalues are simply the sum of the eigenvalues of the one-dimensional oscillators along the Cartesian directions. And the energy eigenstates are simply the tensor products of the energy eigenstates of one-dimensional oscillators along the Cartesian directions. This may appear really simple, but actually it provides us with a really powerful foundation from which to study a range of really interesting properties that emerge when we have an isotropic quantum harmonic oscillator. I therefore encourage you to check out the video on the degeneracies of the three-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator, or the videos where we look at the isotropic three-dimensional oscillator as a central potential. And as always, if you liked the video, please subscribe.